So the, the title of the talk, if it has a title, it's really just some reflections, uh, comes from the book that Joel and I wrote together a couple of years ago. It actually took us about 10 years to write. Joel is a professor at Ohio State, uh, uh, both a colleague and a very close friend, uh, and a really brilliant guy. Uh, so many of the really good ideas I, I, if there are any, I'll say, if there are any really good ideas that I say today that you're impressed by, they probably came from him. Uh, he's a really uh, wonderful uh, scholar and also a uh, really committed guy. And I, I uh, you know, always want to flag everything along the way that he was involved in all this. It wasn't just, just me. So uh, I'm, my goal today is to just sort of very briefly review a little bit of the science uh, where we're at. You all know that, but just to kind of underline it uh, and, uh, and to give you some very recent data. And then I'm going to talk uh, quickly about uh, the framework that Joel and I put together, and which is a sort of fourfold framework of political futures, you might say. And then I'm going to reflect, reflect just briefly, explain each of them. And then uh, I'll move on to the critiques and, and perhaps uh, some reflections on what we might know, uh, what we might think about uh, concerning the virus and how we might think about climate change uh, in the world that follows the pandemic. So here we go. So this is a graph from uh, the IPCC's report last year, the uh, International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you probably all know about it, uh, the IPCC's report last year, they, they have a regular assessment reports that they release, but they released this in a special sense uh, on its own, it's kind of a supplement last year, you probably heard about it. And people have been calling it the 1.5 degree report because it's a reflection on the actual effects of 1.5 degrees, which at the Paris, uh, meetings in 2015 was agreed to be the sort of uh, the goal we were aiming for, the target, the overall temperature change target. Uh, and it was seen to be a kind of especially good one, you know, the, in the sense that much of the conversation prior to this had been that we would aim for a two degree change. But at Paris, uh, you know, led by the, in my opinion, quite empty leadership of uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, the agreement came to 1.5, at least as a target. So the IPCC has done some work to tell us what that would actually look like. Um, and this is what it would look like uh, right here. If we wanna hit 1.5 degrees, we, at cur on the current trajectory, we will hit 1.5 degrees sometime between 2030 and 2052. Um, to avoid uh, going any higher, we'll need to drastically reduce clearly emissions on a trajectory like this which will clearly require, uh, I shouldn't laugh, uh, you know, a fundamental transformation of uh, not only our energy system, but certainly Joel and I would argue with our political economic arrangements and arguably with even perhaps the material structure of the planet, given the kinds of uh, energy system construction and development we'll need. So this is a, this is a, you know, a daunting prospect. Um, but we need to take it seriously, of course, because the news is not good. Um, again, I won't go too on and on about this. Clearly, this is stuff that you will mostly know, or at least know the shape of, but this is data from ice cores uh, from Dome C in Antarctica, which has been glaciated for millions of years and hasn't melted, and so therefore provides a really excellent uh, sort of uh, and consistent uh, place to measure uh, temperature change on the planet over the last 800,000 years. And you can see from the data uh, up until quite recently that's at the bottom of the slide, that clearly uh, the temperature and concentrations of carbon dioxide have, have varied a great deal over time, but in a rather consistent sense, they've mostly varied between about 180 and 280 parts per million um, over the last 800,000 years. Now, this next slide will not surprise any of you, but this is where we're at right now, as of last year. And this is where uh, the IPC suggests we might end up uh, at the top there at 800 uh, in, at the end of the century. So a little bit about 80 years away, my, my children's lifetime. So this is a, you know, uh, this is a big deal <laughs> uh, in terms of where we're at. And it presents obviously, and this is the, this is the origin of the book, it presents a, an enormous challenge for what we might think of blandly as civilization, but certainly for, uh, you know, the, the leadership of, of the various units of the planet to, to kind of confront both at their own jurisdictional level, but also clearly it requires 
It's a global problem that requires some form of global coordination. Now, the, the, the fact that this is an enormous challenge may seem obvious, but I think we need to think hard about why it presents such an enormous challenge. Um, the, the, the scale of the technological changes and introduction and innovation alone, of course, is daunting. Let's set that side aside right now and speak more clearly about the kind of political and social structural issues that we might face. The first challenge, and I think it's perhaps amongst the biggest, if not the biggest, even bigger perhaps than technological change, is, is basically global inequality. This is a chart uh, that shows the per capita emissions and wealth. You can see it's you know, a very, very clear relationship here, which is to say something that you all already know, I'm sure, that the wealthiest people on the planet emit the most, which is also to say that the most powerful people on the planet are those who have to change their behavior and lifestyles the most. That is a big, big ask. And, it, and our previous challenges we've faced when the wealthiest have been forced to sacrifice the most have rarely gone well and rarely gone peacefully. And that's something I think we need to take really seriously. The other thing that we might sort of ask ourselves when we look at a graph like this is say, well, of course, then this is an argument for carbon taxes, which of course it is. Uh, everything we see today is arguably an argument for, for carbon taxes. And any of you who've seen Piketty's new book will know that a big part of his plan is a progressive carbon taxes. And I, you know, certainly I would endorse that and probably many of you as well. But it also must be, you know, we all have to look at the facts and, and the facts are right now that the carbon tax has been effectively meaningless, uh, certainly in terms of changing behavior and, and the energy system. And uh, tax avoidance and tax evasion are only increasing. Um, so we're seeing a situation where, not to mention taxes are falling all over the planet, which Piketty also details quite closely. So, so that is to say that sure, taxes would help a lot, but right now they're not doing anything. And partly that, of course, is because of the fact that the most powerful uh, and the wealthiest are also those who have the most capacity to influence that. Now, you might ask yourself, like I do all the time, because you know my hope is that any kind of ma massive transition is itself not uh, totally disruptive, like anyone else. You know, much of the discussion uh, on the sort of tech side is to say, well, you know, can we not change the the, the, the energy mix? It, Maybe a social or so a political economic transformation of the scale we're talking about is impossible, but certainly we have it, our technological capacities or projected technological capacities to change the energy mix such that that uh, you know we can reduce the impact and perhaps even roll back uh, the, the effects of, of uh, emissions induced climate change. But again, the, the uh, if we're sort of, for lack of a term, better term being somewhat realistic, uh, these calls for a shift in the energy mix uh, or energy system have been fairly loud since I would say the 1970s. And the shift has really not happened. Now, we can look at a chart like this, which comes from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the energy, uh, I can't even think of the name right now, EIA, energy. Anyway, it's the global energy uh, NGO, NGO that's sort of operated by large uh, energy producers. For some reason, I'm blanking on the name right now. At any rate, the point here is that uh, we can see that since between 1971 and 2014, there's been a drastic increase in non-fossil fuel energies, which is fantastic, of course, and we would only want the yellow part of that bar to grow and grow over time. But the problem that we face right now is that the only thing that matters for the climate is the size of the blue bar. The overall fossil fuel energy production is growing and continues to grow right now. It doesn't matter how much the yellow grows if the blue continues to grow as well. The, the, the key goal has to be to leave fossil fuels in the ground. You can, you know, as Joel and I say somewhat jokingly, you can drive to hell in a Tesla just as easily as an F-150. And this mix itself is, is, not, uh, is not meaningful as long as the blue is growing. Now, to change this again is a radical demand. It's asking in many ways to the, the, some of the world's most powerful, uh, wealthiest states and their uh, most wealthy citizens to give up what has been, at least until quite recently, the most, uh, some of the most valuable assets the world has ever known. Um, the effects of the oil price change uh, on this, uh, I wouldn't, 
I'm not in a position yet to, to, to assess. I'd really like to hear what other people are thinking. I think that's a, a factor in where, where we'll be at the end of the pandemic if there is an end. Uh, that is very interesting and I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that. Um, another reason uh, I think that we face such a significant challenge among many others, I'm just picking a few here, is that I would argue that there's a, there, there is a, perhaps I might even use the word drastic, but certainly a systematic underappreciation or underestimation of the scale of the problem ahead of us here. We are already in quite bad shape and the momentum uh, uh, of the system is, is such that even if we were to cut off emissions now, we still will have a great deal of negative impacts. Um, and so as an example of this underestimation, I just wanted to pull up this graph. This is also from the IPC's most recent AR5, um, the, the uh, assessment report five. And this comes from its working group two, uh, which is the, looks at uh, the social and economic dimensions of the problem. And this is uh, a chart that it's put together. It sometimes gets called the burning embers diagram because it does sort of look like that. And we can see here that they've outlined what they call five reasons for concern, RFCs. And I just wanted to point, to, uh, point your attention to reasons for concern three and reasons for concern four. In both cases, you'll see that the IPCC judges us at 1.5 degrees as being in the moderate zone, which uh, they would also define as so-called severe, but uh, uh, sorry, detectable, but not severe. And this is the, the RFC three distribution of impacts is effectively what you might think of as the climate justice or the, the, the environmental justice dimensions of the distribution of the climate impacts, such that of course, uh, the concern would be that the vast majority of people who pay the costs, both with their lives and their livelihoods for climate change, are those who have had very little to do with the, with the production of the problem itself. They are the poor, especially in the poorest parts of the world, um, and they are the most vulnerable, but they will uh, pay the costs um, more than anyone else. And so that's the concern. And the IPCC judges that concern to be moderate. Both Joel and I, from a detailed and long-winded reading of the literature, would suggest that's a massive underestimation of the inequality of the impacts that are already existing, let alone those to come. And the second is that we're looking at 1.5 degrees of global, global aggregate impacts of, according to the IPC's measures, again, uh, of, of a moderate degree. That seems to me totally untenable at this moment. Even with the momentum, uh, even with, again, if we cut emissions entirely, the momentum inside the system of the already existing changes we expect from past emissions would push us past any kind of moderate uh, situation. We're looking at having to deal with drastic changes in our livelihoods, even if, again, as we stop now. And I happen to have the good fortune of having a colleague at Simon Fraser, who is one of the authors of the IPCC's uh, scientific side of things, Kirsten Zickfeld, and she would, uh, she laughed when I showed her these graphs. Um, this, this is a, you know, a, a considerably milder estimation of where we're at. So with all this in mind, bad news, I apologize, uh, though, again, I'm betting that everyone on the call has more, has, has, has read more and more and more about this than anything I'm saying, telling you here. But in reaction to this, Joel and I, in about 2008 or nine, got together and started to think about, you know, what, what are the, what does the world look like in the face of these challenges. How, do, how, how could we even imagine, even just the two of us, but clearly talking to lots of other people, how could we even imagine confronting this problem? What would the futures look like as a way of managing this in some way at all? And then the second question that we wanted to ask, which I think we need to ask, is what if we don't? What if we, what if we aren't up to the task? What, what, what if emissions, uh, what if concentrations hit uh, 800 to 1,000 at the end of the century. What does the world look like? What does the, and what does the world look like? Not so much environmentally or ecologically. We were concerned with what does the world look like politically? What politics is produced by a world that is on fire? Um, and if we can avoid that, what politics will produce a world that doesn't light on fire? And so these were our two questions. Taking the 1.5 degrees seriously. If we're to achieve a 45% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 and 99% reduction by 2050, which is the IPCC's 
uh, recommendation, one might say, then how would we do so? What political processes could make that happen? What possibly could make that happen? And let alone not making it happen, but what could make it happen in a, in a manner that we consider just? And then secondly, as I said, if we do not achieve this and climate change reaches some threshold at which it's globally impossible to ignore, which is, uh, I think, already here in much of the world and certainly coming where we live, then what are the likely political outcomes? What, what processes or strategies will emerge in, in that world? These are the two sort of motivating questions. And after a lot of discussion and this, uh, you know, this summary will mean you never have to read the book probably, <laughs> but uh, we developed what seems, I think, probably like a somewhat simplistic approach, a kind of heuristic, uh, but I think it, it, at least for us, it helped us think about the sort of possibilities uh, that uh, in a broad set of trajectories that may be ahead of us, at least as a way of framing the problem. So the first thing we said to ourselves is, and we're not the only ones saying this, of course, many of you are probably saying it, and certainly many, many other authors are saying this. And this is the question of the, the relationship between a, uh, a world undergoing rapid and accelerating climate change and capitalism, the existing you know, dominant mode of economic organization. Many people, both the defenders of capitalism and its greatest critics, you know, argue that climate change poses a threat to the very functioning of that way of organizing our economic lives. Um, and I think that that's sort of undeniable, whether or not capitalism can survive it, uh, I, that's not a question I'm in the position to answer. Um, uh, but I do think that the, the, the capacity of global capitalism to persist in its existing form without radical transformation in the face of climate change is a question that we have to ask. Um, and part of that question, of course, has to be asked purely because of the geopolitical conditions under which the, the, we're facing this problem with the, some would say, rise or perhaps even you know, imminent hegemony of China, which is capitalist in some ways, but then in fundamentally important ways, of course, not quite capitalist, at least as the sort of standard theory would take it. So in this four by, two by two table, we have a capitalist and non-capitalist sort of future trajectory. And I'll try and explain why we, we've been so heavy handed there. Um, beyond just the heuristics of it all. And then the second uh, axis, you might say, is this uh, the question of planetary sovereignty, which is only to put a name to the problem that thousands of people have identified, which is the fact that the problem is global. Uh, global coordination is essential uh, to, to facing it. Uh, individual responses uh, have thus far proven either futile, uh, and the, the, the ecology of the planet would suggest that that's quite a reasonable expectation, um, but also that the, there is a need in the order, in, in the very possibility of stabilizing a social order, whether or not it's in a world on fire or a world that's cooling, um, will require a kind of planetary organization. Now, we use the term sovereignty, but we could be, if sovereignty makes you think of a monarch, then, uh, then scale that back a little bit and just think about some form of enforceable global order. That could be an agreement, a coordination, but it would have the capacity to, to impose and enforce you know, rules around energy systems or emissions, that kind of thing. A, a, a sovereign in that sense, on the climate front. And if you, if you divide the world up as we did in this four by four table, for, for the uses of thinking about the future, we came up with four uh, systems you might say, or four trajectories, let's say, for the, the, the future, uh, looking at the world as it, as it warms up. And these are all, I should step back a second here and say, um, sure, many of you have heard the term, uh, heard the phrase, climate change is the, the greatest collective action, collective action problem the world has ever known. Um, the most famous phrasing of it is by Nicholas Stern in the Stern Report. Um, but many people have said something like it. It suggests, of course, that, that the problem facing us is uh, the individualized, not just at the uh, personal level, but also at the nation state level, sense of the experience of the problem, the lack of global coordination, and the lack of a, of a framework within which the collective action problem, as famously uh, framed by Olson in, the, in 1970, the collective action problem might be solved by some uh, realization of uh, a collective interest that trumps or 
unfortunate term, term to use, sorry, a collective uh, interest that, that uh, might dominate um, individual responses. And so we could think of each of these as, even though uh, I, I would argue that they don't necessarily think of themselves this way, except for climate Leviathan, uh, we could think of these as, as answers to the collective action problem going forward. And if we did think of that, and I'll explain why in a couple seconds, we might say that, I would say that climate Leviathan is a poor answer to that question. Climate behemoth is no answer to that question. Climate Mao is a bad answer to that question, which leaves us with climate X as potentially an answer to the question. And it's, uh, uh, Joel and I uh, have left that box largely empty because it's inchoate and in formation. So uh, let me explain a little bit about each of these, then I'll uh, reflect uh, briefly on some connections perhaps to the to the virus and then uh, I'd love to hear what people are thinking and having to say. So this is, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but uh, but but if you're not, this is the cover from Hobbes's uh, 1651 book, Leviathan, uh, which was written, as most of you probably know, in the midst of the English Civil War, and it was an argument for a supreme power. Uh, not necessarily because Hobbes was a monarchist, though he was, uh, but, but it was an argument that uh, the, the collective action problem, we might say, could only be solved by having everyone submit to one power. And that one power, Hobbes said, would allow the, the ongoing reproduction of civil society, and we might even think of it as a modern economy, um, insofar as it abandoned the political or the political questions of rule to the one power. And that would prevent what Hobbes was most afraid of, which was civil conflict. So the social order's persistence depended, and the world around him seemed to suggest this, the, the, the social order's persistence depended upon all submitting and obeying one power in whom would be vested the capacity to force obedience. But the, but the, the obedience would be bought with the promise of peace. And this was the world that, that Hobbes was proposing. And you can see here that the, his vision, insofar as the drawing captures it, uh, re really was intended to, to describe the way in which the, the sovereign was an individual, a mortal god, he called him, but, but also was composed of the submission of the others. So you can see that his body is made up of uh, hundreds of people looking toward him, all facing toward him in their own interests. Um, and we, without in any way meaning to, to take all of Hobbes' messages, uh, called the book Climate Leviathan because we see the dominant response, the one we, we think is unfolding or beginning to unfold right now, perhaps in the form of the, the, uh, the COP meetings that we see in Paris at any rate, as, as an attempt to kind of build uh, or to, or as a sign of a kind of emergent force toward which something like a Leviathan-like power in the climate realm uh, might come to be. And we actually would argue that there's a significant proportion, especially of sort of uh, educated, uh, concerned, and reasonably well-off folks in the Western Europe and North America who, who are really invested in this idea that, that, that the, the Council of Parties will come up with an idea that does impose, in some senses, a, not quite Leviathan-like, but certainly a regime, a carbon regime on the planet that will save us. And so you may remember the desperation that, that seemed to disseminate through the, the, what, what Americans would call the liberal community you know, around the time of Copenhagen, when people were really hoping that the world would come together and make up some rules about how we could live in a way that would help us. And we see the desire for this as being very much a kind of caught up in, in the, the political moment. Um, the, the, the reason that it has to confront, uh, you know, the planetary problem, of course, is again, the collective action problem, you might say. Climate, climate change clearly puts pressure on the lack of a global, global rulemaking or enforcement mechanism. Um, and also, the, it, it relies to some extent, as, as perhaps we might expect, on, on a division that Hobbes made fundamental to this situation which is the division between political society, which is the realm of the rulers, and civil society, where uh, individuals enjoy some freedom on the premise that the rule makers 
will be free to make the rules as they see. Um, and this is clearly, uh, you know, uh, sort of imposable, we might think of on a, on a global carbon regime. Um, the, one of the problems, and I'll get to this in a second, is, is that I would say one of the sort of fundamental problems is that uh, we get ourselves in a situation here in which the collective action problem is, is understood to be uh, an incentive problem effectively. So in other words, this mode of organization, which is dedicated to the persistence of the existing order, we might say, existing liberal capitalist societies. If, if that is to persist, then the collective action problem is understood effectively as an incentive problem, which is to say that it kind of denies, not even kind of, it does deny in many ways the very possibility of a solidarity in the interests of a self-interested uh, ob obedience, one might say. And the possibilities of that uh, are limited, I would argue, insofar as the, prob the problem ahead requires more than just uh, uh, a better directed self-interest. As an example of, of how this thinking is going, I pulled up this, uh, this is uh, kind of drawn from, though it's not, it's not uh, a direct uh, clip, but it's, a, it's drawn from uh, Edenhofer and Stern's uh, 2010 document toward a global green recovery, uh, recommendations for immediate G20 action, which they wrote and published and was widely circulated amongst the G20 folks in, in 2010 and 2011. Um, and what it describes in many ways, I would argue, uh, is, and this, and this is one way in which uh, there's some very strong parallels, I believe, with how we're thinking about how to deal with the post-pandemic condition. Um, what, it, what it does effectively is it looks at the problem in, in what Joel and I would say are, are, is a vaguely green Keynesian mode. Um, it understands the state's sort of options at this point as being of twofold effectively. One would be to step into the economy take over, not the whole thing, but certain industries or sectors or whatever, straighten things out um, and remove private actors from the, from the field, at least temporarily, to allow for the solution to the, to the collective action problem. And we can see here that in some ways, this is what's unfolding in a kind of punctuated Keynesianism, is that the, the state might step in, do the work that it can do, and then in phase two, it provides, it slowly steps back by providing the private sector with incentives, uh, allowing for subsidization, um, the movement of medium term measures to provide the private sector with better incentives, this kind of thing. So it's a kind of punctuated Keynesianism that we might see, I think, uh, and almost certainly we'll see as a suggestion for how we deal with the, the, the post COVID world. Um, and this is all in some senses caught up in the frame of market failure, right? So the state can produce uh, a collective action problem solution via solving or uh, remediating market failure here and information problems. So this is all part of what we understand to be the climate leviathan strategy. Oops, sorry. This is effectively the simplest way to, to make sense of what we call climate Mao, which you may remember is in the bottom left corner. It's the, 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 the trajectory we describe as both uh, invested in some form of planetary sovereignty or coordination, but a non-capitalist sense, uh, in a non-capitalist sense. And insofar as it's non-capitalist, I really want to flag here, and Joel and I do a lot of work in the book to try to make this clear, that we are not, Climate Mao is not a code for climate China, uh, nor is it a code for climate Xi Jinping. This is, this is actually meant to point toward the sort of radical Maoist tradition that has never gone away uh, in East Asia. Um, and so insofar as that's true, nothing like climate Mao currently exists, but we do think it's possible. Um, uh, and it's possible precisely because of this. This is a, a map uh, of uh, people with livelihoods at risk from severe climate change. And you can see that, China, that Asia is just balloons relative to the rest of the planet. Um, and we would argue that this combination, a sort of combustible set of relatively uh, increasingly fragile livelihoods, much of which are based in rural quasi peasant uh, conditions, uh, puts the, uh, and that mixed with a sort of agrarian political radical tradition that drove both Mao and also the Maoists in Nepal and North India, 
and uh, other parts of uh, East and Southeast Asia mean that there's a political culture that makes it quite possible that the response in the medium term to climate devastation will be a political radicalism that perhaps takes a, a Maoist form, or at least is inspired by Mao. Um, now, whether that'll happen, of course, we may be totally wrong, but we do see the seeds of this there. And it's not necessarily the Chinese Communist Party that, that is the best indicator of that right now. Um, uh, climate X, sorry, cli uh, I, I forgot about climate behemoth. Climate behemoth, so when we wrote the book, it was during the Obama years. And for us, climate behemoth was, was sort of instantiated by Sarah Palin and the drill baby drill, uh, nationalist, uh, often quite racist uh, framing that, that claimed both that any kind of non-national sovereignty was illegitimate, but also that for the most part, climate change was a hoax uh, imposed by uh, other powers or some global conspiracy. We never could have imagined the form that it has taken now. I think we thought Palin was about as bad as it could get. Um, we were clearly wrong uh, about that. The, the extent to which Trump has kind of enacted the worst version of what we thought behemoth would be uh, is, you know, one might argue that we were sort of prescient. I don't think Joel and I were prescient. We were as astounded as the rest of the world in some senses. Uh, not so much by the election of Trump as by uh, the way in which this has been normalized. Um, but at any rate, behemoth is meant to, to, to mark uh, an order that refuses international coordination of any sort, uh, any kind of imposed or enforced rules, uh, and, uh, but, a, but a complete and utter dedication to the maintenance of the current capitalist order. That's the top, top right corner. And then the final bottom right is what we call climate X, which we see as a sort of inchoate but unfolding or emergent uh, refusal of the other three orders. Um, we don't know where that will take us. This is from India uh, in January. Um, we, we, we don't know where this will take us. Um, it could take us really emancipatory places. Uh, local responses, a uh, plethora of movements and, and uh, energy system structure, uh, restructuring in, that is uh, locally uh, specific and historically and culturally meaningful, uh, coordinated as need be at different scales, or it could, of course, take uh, very, very different forms. It's unclear, um, but it also seems to be in many ways, a logical response to what thus far are the glaring failures or terrifying prospects of the other ones. Um, this is why what I meant when I said Leviathan is a poor answer. Behemoth is no answer. Mao is a bad answer. And this is an answer. Um, it's unclear uh, what this will mean. But 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 it is very clearly a response. I would argue to to Leviathan's plans to control this from the elite sphere, to incentivize, to provide, to, uh, to administer this in this kind of uh, non-disruptive, but also non-distributionally equalizing process. Because if we return, say, to this question here, and we look at the global green recovery, the, 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 the question behind it that never gets asked is who does this? Who does the improving? Who does the upgrading? Who does the in incentivizing? Who does the providing? One might argue this, that, that individual states are doing this, but individual states to solve the collective action problem require a coordinated and enforceable mechanism that would take a Leviathan-like form. So we need to think about like, what, you know, what, what's behind all that? We don't know at, this, at the present. And I would argue that, that at least thus far, nothing adequate has arisen. Um, Okay, I'm pretty much done. So just to give you a, a flavor of some of the critiques, uh, a, cu a, couple, a couple that really have mattered to us. The first is that I, I have a great, I have a, a significant number of colleagues caught up in the Green New Deal movement in an effort to kind of, you know, work that out, figure, figure that out. And I have an enormous amount of sympathy for, for it. Um, and, and their critique of our proposal is that we can't abandon the state entirely, uh, or at least we can't 
lose, lose hope in the state entirely at this moment because the state is all we have. Progressives, liberals, however you want to think about it. Our only hope for addressing this problem is the state and we need to embra embrace it as the power that, however limited it is, is at least, you know, gives us some purchase on things. And that's a very important point. Um, I still am very concerned that at least the last 20 years would suggest that that's not going to get us anywhere near where we need to go. The IPCC has made that very clear where we need to go. And uh, I think the state is in the way in a lot of ways right now. But the question, of course, is what I would propose to put in its place. And I don't have a good answer for that. Um, the second, of course, uh, and it's predictable, but also very sound, um, has been voiced uh, by many, but but most recently in a conversation Joel had with Bob Cohane, a sort of many of you will probably know him, but a very prominent and senior political scientist, uh, and and his concern, uh, he 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 endorsed our diagnosis of climate leviathan, hundred percent, and then said the political feasibility of X is zero, um, and that uh, is of course you know a, a judgment, uh, one that I think is is not necessarily to be taken as truth, but it does, but the idea that it's unfeasible clearly needs to be taken seriously because if people believe it's unfeasible, then the movements that might uh, produce the adequate response to climate change uh, won't emerge because people won't believe they're possible. Um, and that might, as I say, be a quite a reasonable reaction. So finally, just a couple reflections on how, what we might learn from this from about, about the virus. Um, and, and I, I, I anticipate that I have nothing more innovative to say than any of you, so I'll be very interested to hear what you have to say. Um, this is just my reflections. But I do think that one, you know, one, of the, one, of the, one of the defining features of where we are in dealing with the pandemic is the extraordinary uncertainty that persists. Nothing, nothing innovative to say that at this moment. But it is to say, I think, therefore, that those who claim they know where we're headed at this moment are, are wrong to say that they can know. Um, I think things are still coming together. And there are a great deal of forces like those Rob identified earlier, actually, uh, that, that, are, that are what we might think of as dilemmas. They're contradictory, or they have uh, sort of complicated possibilities, some of which we might be very excited about and others of which we have great concern about. So for example, the national introversion we've seen right now um, has often been framed as something good. You know, people are taking care of their own or nations are doing their best. Uh, or not their best in some cases, to take care of their own people, to, to deal with their problems internally, to, to build up some self-sufficiency, to shorten supply chains, to figure out a way to kind of manage this so that we're more crisis prepared as we're moving forward, which would clearly be supposedly a good thing for climate change. Um, but that, that, that national introversion obviously also has a very dark side um, in not only a nativist kind of fear of the, the other and uh, the creation of an enormous part of a country that can be unwelcome, but also the idea that just like climate change, the pandemic is, a, is, is an, a structurally global problem and individual responses will, even for those who are fortunate enough to figure something out, leave a great deal of the, of the, the world uh, at risk of, of with a, a great deal of the world without resources at, at a great deal of risk. Um, and I think that that's a very real fear with the pandemic. In fact, I, I, one of my main concerns is that once the wealthiest part of the world is out of this, we forget about the fact that it will still be probably rampaging through Africa, Latin America, uh, and Asia. And we will, for us, the problem will be over. And I think that will be a, both a humanitarian, but also a, an ethical disaster and political disaster. Um, I think the other thing that we have to think about when we try to compare this to climate change, which some people have told me it's a dress rehearsal for, is that I think that the, 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 the timeline, the temporality of this crisis uh, is very, very different. And it produces a whole set of both emergency measures and political reactions that are very different than from climate change. The, the, it, and it also actually makes room for a role for science that thus far climate change has not been able to impose itself uh, you know, via the tax system or various other kinds of energy transition mechanisms. So the, the timeline of the, of the, of the pandemic puts it in a kind of qualitatively different mode. I also think Rob is right that, that the outcome of this is gonna be very bad for the climate movement. Um, I think the climate will get, and totally understandably get pushed down the priority list a long way. And I also think that at least at the beginning of the crisis, the environmental movement did itself no favors by, by arguing that, uh, you know, if we can do this for climate, we can do this. If we can do this for the virus, we can do this for climate. 
insofar as we're comparing the reactions and the and the and the, the necessary the necessary responses between the virus and climate i think that is a disastrous move strategically insofar as this process has been entirely joyless and devastating for hundreds of millions of people and to promise them that this is how we have to this is what we have to do to do to deal with climate is not at all going to uh, bring people on board uh, for that process um, and finally i would just say that that to, to reiterate something I said just a couple minutes ago, I, I think that, that, that what perhaps the most important lesson we can learn right now is to be sharp-eyed and wary, more than imagining that there are specific lessons the approach to the pandemic can teach us about how we might deal with climate change. I think that in particular, the way in which many of our political economic structures have been built around sort of fairly rigid decision rules, if you might think of it as sort of an inflation targeting central bank writ large across political economic regulation, um, I think those things will crumble. Uh, I think that our responses have to be more temporally and, and geographically specific. I think our I think our economics needs to try to make sense of where we're at at any one moment as opposed to some long run promise. And I think that uh, the, because I think that the world of the long run promise has been pretty much entirely delegitimized by this promise by this uh, by the virus. And climate change uh, will require a similar kind of uh, alertness, let's say. <laughs>